Good morning. Did it go off? Hello. All right. Hey, how are you? We're ready to go. All right. Good morning. We are extremely happy that you guys are here. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I woke up this morning because uh, I had a dream that I was supposed to preach and I didn't have anything ready. And so I am very happy that that is not the case this morning. And so I'm happy Tony's here and going to be preaching. Um, it is Easter, and, and what, a, what a wonderful day uh, to be gathered in the house of the Lord. We're going to start this morning with just a prayer, and then we're going to watch a, a quick video. So if you'll join me with prayer to start this day off, that'd be great. Father God, thank you so much for today. We thank you for what this day represents, and Father, what, the, what you did for us so long ago, and, and how, how much has impacted our lives even today. Father, the fact that we have a hope, and that even three days ago when it looked so bleak and so dreary when you were on the cross. Today is a day of triumph and victory because the tomb is empty and death has been defeated. Father, we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. The king is dead. The hand that once held a branch now gripped a hammer. The king is dead. This king of kings who embraced the very nature of a servant. This prince of peace broken for us. This commander of angels surrendered to a cross. This king joins us in our suffering empathizes in our weakness and he calls us to die with him to lay down our lives to live in surrender that we may be fully alive the king is dead long live the king stand as we sing this song we're here today imagine for a moment that it's the king is still dead we know that why he went is because his blood had to be shed hebrews the ninth chapter the 22nd verse without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness and his blood was shed his love ran red and our sins are forgiven let's sing this song there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in awe of you I'm in awe of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe
third act. There is a third day. And on that third day, the king will strip death of its power and extinguish the sting of Hades. This king is not defeated. This king is not destroyed. This king is the resurrection. He is the life. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The king has returned, leaving death behind, destroying hate, inviting us all to live in his victory, in his kingdom. Let's sing this song.
On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all the faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up by victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. He is risen. I think sometimes we take for granted how blessed we are to be able to stand on the timeless truths of God and his holy word and yet be able to shake things up a little once in a while. We're just able to hear Faith share some scripture with us. If some of you have been around in the last few weeks sometimes, some of you haven't. Through Willie's leading, we're using some of our young people to be involved so that they're trained to be able to be comfortable sharing their faith. And I think that's a, a great thing for us to be doing. Um, on an, any normal Easter Sunday morning, we would have already had uh, probably kids do some leading of a sunrise service, but we shook that up a little bit this morning also. And what a wonderful experience we were able to have as we walked through that final week of Jesus' life. And we thank Monica so much for setting that up for us and, and allowing us to experience that. Also, usually we've uh, sung a communion hymn and then had the meditation. Max came up last week after the song Forever and expressed the sentiments that I've often had, I think said once in a while, it's just that you feel kind of inadequate to say anything more or to try to add to the words of some of these songs. With Sue being on the worship team, I looked at what songs were gonna be for this summer, uh, for this Sunday, and evidently somehow made a mistake and probably looked at last week. So anyway, I thought forever was going to be done again. So I asked Tony if it would be all right if we closed with that instead of the meditation if I went first. And being as accommodating as they are and feeling the power of that song also, he uh, emailed me back that, yeah, we'll go ahead and change to that song for this week again. <laughs> and uh, let me come up here first. When we were talking about that, uh, we, we talked about some words. I want to share a few of the words of the song first. It says, a battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. As I thought about those words this week, I kind of did some searches and looked, and you know, we're really not told much in the Bible about exactly what happened those, those three days as, as Jesus' body was put in the grave. And evidently, it's not important for us to know exactly how things transpired, it's just what transpired. Obviously, he had left his earthly body by that time. We don't know if there was an epic battle for control over Satan, or if Jesus lifted his spiritual little finger and it was done. But it was done. And the words that Tony and I shared as being so powerful in this next song follow that. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected king has rendered you defeated. And the song goes on to not only acknowledge that defeat of Satan and death and our eternal life because of it, but to say that forever he is risen, forever our battle is won. We don't have to bring sacrifices yearly and all of the things that the people did in the Old Testament because his perfect sacrifice once and for all established that victory over death for us forever. As we prepare our hearts for this song and for gathering around the table to share those elements that represent his shed blood and broken body on the cross for us, Let's give praise and thanks that it was a once and forever victory. If you feel able, I would ask you to go ahead and stand with me for prayer and for this song of communion preparation. Would you stand? <coughs> Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you as we gather around your table 
in awe of the love that sent your son Jesus to make that sacrifice on the cross for us, in awe of your power and glory that allowed his victory over death and his resurrection to bring us eternal life forever. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him breath he gave as heaven looked away the son of god was laid in darkness a battle in the grave the war on death was waged the power of hell forever broken the ground began to shake Sun was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever he is glorified. Forever he
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. You may be seated.
I pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this most special day that you've given to us, a day when we can celebrate our risen Savior and know that Jesus is alive. We're just thankful to, to be able to come into your house today and worship you and, and give thanks. We ask your blessing on this offering now. May it go far to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. for all her hard work. I made the mistake of asking her, could you do something, you know, that the kids would love and everything, when she, she, she took the ball and, like, ran to the home run with it, you know, anyway, so, um, and so it was just fun to be able to put it together and hope you enjoyed the Easter experience. Just a few announcements before we get into this morning's message. You may notice out here in the foyer a, a tower with a bunch of envelopes on it. Next Sunday is our Camp Sunday. Drew Fulmer, the director of Central Iowa Bible Camp, will be with us during our Bible school hour. But one of the things we want to do, and this was just something he made available to us as churches, is we want to give a gift to camp this year. And there's a number on each of those envelopes, and we're just asking you to consider pulling one of those envelopes off and giving that amount to the camp. Uh, camp starts, we see that VBS starts in six weeks. That's what this little number is. Camp starts in six weeks um, as well, high school camp. And so, and then I'll be camp with fifth and sixth grade. It's a whole summer of camp going on. Um, but we have lots of people involved in our church camp. And so just be in prayer for camp. Drew will be here next Sunday. Tell us more. But we want to make a gift. We want to give a gift to Drew and the camp as they begin this camp season. Monica and I pulled off the year, or how old we turn this month and next. And so it's gone, so you can just guess which one's gone. But we're gonna, we chose to give that as a gift to, to, to camp. And then also another announcement is, you may have noticed on the slides of the announcements before, we're taking a group to go see Tim Hawkins, and uh, that money needs to be turned in today. If you have questions, see Randy West right here. He is the, the go-to guy on that, and, uh, and Julie as well. And Last week, she was in the nursery, so it's like Julie can take the money. Randy can answer the questions on, on that as well, and so... Uh, a lot of other things going on. Youth groups is winding down. Oh, the survey, the life group surveys in the bulletin. Please check the bulletin out. Read up, read up what you got and, and things like that. Okay, 
So you can give it to Julie in the office or leave it on the hospitality center. That would be awesome. I want to begin with a word of prayer. And then we're going to begin listening to the Easter story. But let's pray first. Father God, we just asked that you would speak to our hearts, that you will fill us with wonder as we hear this story today. Thank you, Lord, for it. Thank you for what it means to us and uh, in our lives, in our faith. And Father, will you just use this day to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The Easter story. It's an interesting story. It's a troubling story. I want you to ask if you would just close your eyes and that you would just imagine it's the very first time you heard this story. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielding up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tomb also were opened. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how the imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, in order, therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell people, He is risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him of the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who has been crucified, but he is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb, with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. The Easter story is a troubling story. It's an interesting story, but it is a profound story for us. And sometimes we as followers of Christ and even as non-believers may wonder about this story and as the disciples may think it's kind of a far tale, the tale of a man being risen from the dead. But the story is very real to us, and it's very real as well. As Jesus indeed died, he was buried, and he rose from the tomb. But on that first Sunday, the day after uh, that Sabbath, when Jesus was risen, the, the ladies, 
went to this tomb. And I want to for, for a moment focus on the ladies. You, also, you see earlier that when Joseph of Arimathea asked to take the body of Jesus down from the cross, and they went and took his body to the tomb that Joseph had, it mentions that the ladies took note of where they laid him. And then they went home and began to prepare spices. Well, now it's a couple of days later. They are early in the morning. The sun is just rising. And they go to the tomb. And as they're going to the tomb, they wonder this question. Who will roll the stone away from us from the entrance of the tomb? Who's going to move the stone? For the sake of many of you who are guests with us today, we this month have been looking at the life of Peter, a man whose name means rock, a man whose name means stone. And we see how Jesus and his, uh, Peter's encounter with Jesus, how he was moved so many times. And so we've been focusing on when a stone moves. Well, today we literally see a physical stone moving. And the women, as they are making their way, remember, they went a couple of days before the Resurrection Sunday, went and saw exactly where Jesus was laid. Then they went home and prepared spices. And as they're early in the morning, making their way, they ask the question, who's going to move the stone? We know that the stone was moved by the angels. But we also see that the women, they were moved when the stone moved moved inwardly, but we also notice that Peter is moved inwardly. So we've been looking at the life of Peter, we see, and primarily from the Gospel of Matthew, and I want to thank Willie for reading this part of the story, because Peter all of a sudden just drops from the scene in Matthew's Gospel. The last time we see Peter in the book of Matthew is the 26th verse, 26th chapter, and it says, And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. That's where we left Peter off last week. Peter denying Jesus in a courtyard, the courtyard of the high priest, but he didn't stay stuck in that courtyard. He went out. And that's a key phrase for us to capture today. He went out. He went, because I hope that not only did the message of the stone being moved move the the women, it moved Peter, hopefully it moves us as well. When a stone moves, it needs to affect us. Peter went out and wept bitterly. Mark's gospel tells us the exact same moment in Peter's life. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he went down and wept. We see in later, though, that that's not the last time Peter's mentioned. It's interesting that at the tomb, in Mark's gospel, Peter's mentioned one more time. And it says, the the angels are saying to the women, but go tell his disciples... And Peter, and Peter, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he, just as he told you. I think that's powerful. Why did the angels say to the women, go tell the disciples, and Peter? Because most of the Gospels end with Peter being specifically mentioned, at the courtyard. Matthew ends with him there. Mark ends with him there. What's Peter doing? He went out weeping bitterly. Peter's feeling like he just made the biggest mess, biggest worst decision in his life to deny his Savior. Even if I have to die, I will not deny you. And Jesus says, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Peter's probably feeling like, I am the biggest loser there is. And so the angels say to the women, make sure you tell the disciples, but especially make sure you look up Peter and you tell him he's going before you. I am not done with you yet, Peter. 
Matthew records the, the, at the courtyard. Mark records at the courtyard. But Mark adds this little comment. We go to Luke, but we see that Peter is mentioned at the tomb. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. John adds a little bit to that. I love John's account of Peter going to the tomb. you got to understand John is this young guy, and he wants to get his jab. Notice the jab. So Peter went out with the other disciple, a.k.a. John, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. You know, who is it? What, what kid does not want to say, a young person want to say to an old guy, I beat you, I beat you. That's what John's doing in his gospel. Hey, we're both going to the tomb, we're running, but I was faster than the old man Peter. He just wanted to give his dig. Anyway, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. I envision this. John's bending over, looking into the tomb, and Peter made sure that John got a nudge as he went in. That's just me. I'm just saying. It's like, I'll show you, you little punk. Get out of my way. And he goes into the tomb. He went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the faith cloth, face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first. Catch it? Another jab. Yeah, but I was first. Anyway. And he went in and saw and believed. The Easter story is a powerful story. It's an impactful story. And those who saw it, even though it seemed like nonsense, they saw it and they believed. They wondered what, who would move the stone and they saw the stone move and they believed. I want to encourage you, if you will, to open to Luke. Luke, the 24th chapter, because I want to read a portion of this story. Willie read to us from Matthew's account. But I want to read Luke's account for just a few few verses. But on the first day of the week, starting with verse 1, on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But then they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus there. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by, by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all those things to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other woman with whom told them these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them as idle tale, and they did not believe them. For these words seemed like an idle tale. As I mentioned, this, the resurrection story is a powerful story. It's a, it's a fascinating story. But it's a troubling story. And even today, there are those who wrestle with this story. Maybe you're one that wrestles with this story. Why did it have to happen? Did it really happen? Next Sunday afternoon, uh, Rich and Sue's life group is inviting the whole church to just come and see how maybe the first century people wrestled with this story and many others and i want to just encourage you to watch this trailer of this video if it'll go adam i'm going to go ahead and just start it thank you when the messiah comes rome will be nothing until then the nazarene said he'd rise again after three days We will lose peace and order if it's true. Will the people believe it? 
the weak will. There will be no other gods. Kill him. The tomb is sealed, guarded with your life. Tyrion, Pilate summons you. The body has vanished. His tomb is empty. Where has he gone? You tell me. Already they're proclaiming him risen from death. The Emperor cannot arrive to unrest. We must find a body. Oh, no! Home the city for bodies dead in the last week. Take them up. Everyone. His disciples. Where are they hiding his corpse? It was not his followers. Another body, sir. Just revealed. No. Who told you the Nazarene was alive? Mary Magdalene. You're looking for something you'll never find. Open your heart and see. No more lies. What happened to the body? The ropes, they just exploded. You should have returned by now. I have seen two things which cannot reconcile. A man dead without question. And that same man alive again. What frightens you? Big Ram. Wagering eternity on it. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to see this movie or not. I haven't. And so I'm looking forward to being able to see it. Um, and uh, but just for many, the tale of the story is an idle tale. It's nonsense. But yet the story is real. And the story needs to move us. Remember I said Matthew records Peter the last time he is recorded of him is in the disciple or in the, the courtyard. And it said he went out and wept bitterly. He moved. If you look at J Luke chapter 24, verse 12, you see this word. But Peter rose and rode to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. He was moved by what had happened. He marveled at what happened. And Peter, and for some reason, that phrase, and he went home marveling, has captured me this week. I've read this story hundreds of times. I've preached this story dozens of times. But for some reason, the thought of the story and being marveled by that story captures me. But what is, it that ought to, what is it that ought to capture our imagination? What is it that we need to marvel at? Peter did not stay stuck in a courtyard and he went out and wept bitterly. Early on that resurrection day, he went out to the tomb and then he went home and marveled at what had happened. That day was filled with amazing things that happened. We see that as you read on in, in Luke's chapter, you see that Jesus made a point to meet many different people on that day. And somewhere in the course of that day, from morning to evening, between when he went home, Jesus met Peter. It's something that is confirmed by Paul when he writes in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the 5th verse. And he says, he appeared to Mary Magdalene and Peter, and then to us 12, and then to 500, and then to me as a disciple later, unlikely born. Sometime in that day, Jesus meets Peter. And sometime in that day, 
While Peter was marveling at what had happened, Jesus meets him. In a moment, we're going to have an opportunity to go home. We're going to get a chance to move from here and go on. What are we to marvel at? I think we can marvel at what Jesus says to them a little bit later. Sorry the print's small, but I wanted to get it all on one screen. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scripture. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day and rise from the dead, and that for repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name of all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. We are witnesses of these things. Jesus focuses on two things we are to marvel at. One, we are to marvel in His resurrection. That the Savior, the Christ, must suffer and die, and on the third day He would raise. That there would be a death, a burial, and then there would be a resurrection. That is something marvelous for us to ponder. Jesus' death, His burial, and resurrection. Because if it didn't happen, we have no reason to be here today. If it's just an idle tale to us, we have no reason to be here today. But marvel in the truth that Jesus died. The Christ, He suffered. He died. He was buried. But He rose from the dead. And there was a battle that raged as the song we sang. Marvel at that truth. But there's a second thing that Jesus said in that passage. He also mentions that repentance and forgiveness of sins happens. Marvel at His resurrection, but marvel at what happens because of His death, burial, and resurrection. And the reason I believe that Peter was moved, and hopefully we are moved as well, is because that night when Jesus met them, as the disciples are locked in that room, and Jesus appears, as they're telling stories about Mary Magdalene seeing, and Peter seeing, and two disciples who are on their way to Emmaus are there, and they're telling their story about seeing Jesus. All of a sudden, Jesus is standing in their midst, and it says, He opened their minds to the Scriptures, that they could marvel at the Christ suffering and dying and being raised on the, on the third day, and that there would be forgiveness it's a powerful message. It's a message that we need to take home. It's a story we need to take home with us. And I think it's a, me, uh, it's a message that Peter took home with him. He went home and he marveled. The reason I say I think Peter took it home and he marveled is because it is those two points that Peter preached. In Acts chapter 2. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in the midst of, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of flawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it is not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, and they may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You have made... You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And Peter goes on and says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh See corruption. And then he goes these words. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that Christ, or that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And then it goes to say, 
Then those who heard this were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the disciples, what shall I do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, he opened their eyes. He said, the Christ has got to die. Peter goes, the Christ died. The Christ was buried. Peter said, he was buried. You crucified him. He was put in the ground, but he's not still there. He is risen. Marvel at that story. But today, will you marvel at the second part? That repentance, for the forget through, through repentance, the forgiveness of sins is available to us. It's available to every one of us still today. Because this story is so profound, this story can be so troubling, but it's only troubling if we do not believe. Maybe we need to start with belief. Belief that it is true. Belief that Jesus Christ died, that you might have the hope of eternal life. That you might have the forgiveness of sins. Believe and then repent. Make a change of life and confess, your, confess Jesus Christ as Lord and then be immersed. The Scripture says the power of immersion is in the death, the burial, the resurrection of, of Christ. That's why we baptize by immersion. It is a, it's a death. We die to our sinful self. We bury that self, but we rise to a new life. That's the powerful message that Jesus opened their eyes. And may He open your eyes to it today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you moved everyone around there on that day. You started by moving a stone and a physical stone. All of a sudden, just what that happened, it just made such a difference in people's life. Mary Magdalene and Mary and Joanna and so many of the ladies. You made a difference in Peter's life. You made a difference in John's life. You made a difference in the lives of the disciples. And several days later, you made the difference in a city. Because they knew that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And even though He was crucified and buried, He rose. And because He rose, there is forgiveness of sins. Father, will You just help us to go home today and marvel at this story. In Jesus' name, Amen. You stand as we sing this song of response, this song of decision. I stand amazed. I marvel at the story. If you have a decision to make, one of our elders will be up here and Willie will be up here. would love to talk to you about that decision you may have to make on this day.
ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. into that tomb he believed and then it said he went home and he marveled go home and marvel at the power of this story go home and marvel that we serve a risen savior and he lives let's close with this song (laughs) 